I, I argued recently, in fact, at, at Oxford Union, and they didn't get the point because they're all woke, but um, the students, but but there were, you know, there was a debate that's on- That's terrible. That's a terrible thing. That, I, I know. that's but the case, it's so you'll be, terrible. You'll be surprised. There was a debate on, the question was, we are all religious. And I asked to speak on the pro side. My colleagues, my atheist colleagues, who uh, people you know, uh, were on the anti side, and they were shocked that I wanted to speak on the pro side. And my argument was quite simple: if we weren't all religious, we wouldn't need science. If we didn't all want to believe, right? That's that's exactly right, man. And, and, that's exactly and, okay, right. So we agree. I mean, they didn't get the point, and and I would argue yeah. Well, that, that was part of what I was trying to point out to Sam Harris is that, mm -hmm. and this is something I learned at least in part from reading Jung. Like his claim was that. Alchemy, the, the ideas of alchemy grew out of a religious foundation and then science emerged out of alchemy. Yeah. It's like it's nested. Science is nested inside an alchemical fantasy that's nested inside a religious fantasy. Well, so, I wouldn't say nested. I would say it grew out of it. Like I, I, I was born from my mother and father who, you know, and I, I like to think that I grew, that a lot of what I, who I am is that, but, but I grew out but of I, it. Here's why I think it has to be nested still. Okay. Now, and this is something we could talk about a lot. The objects that draw a scientist's attention aren't determined by scientific processes. Yeah. You're, you're, the fantasy, you see what I mean, is that well, the, the, like you, you get interested in some things and you pursue those. Now that's informed by your scientific knowledge, but it's, it's so Jung's point, for example, was that science was a, materialist redemptive myth that grew up as a counterposition to the spiritualist redemptive myth, right? So you imagine there was an idea, which was that we could redeem our inadequacy through spiritual discipline. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, we tried that for a long time. It wasn't enough. People were still suffering from leprosy. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so there's a fantasy emerges over thousands of years. Maybe we should investigate the transformations of matter. There's redemptive information residing in the transformations of matter. We could investigate that and that would make life better. And so the motivational goal behind science is the expansion of human competence. And that's not a scientific goal. That's, yeah, absolutely, that's a absolutely. motivational goal. Yeah, I agree with you. But where I guess that we disagree and we could have this discussion is that I think you're right. And that's what I said before. Scientists are people. So they're motivated by all. They're motivated by greed, by fame, by jealousy, as well as by facts. By awe. By, by awe, awe. awe and wonder. I mean, I would, you know, I yep. want to point out, I mean, we're all, you know, that's why I'm a scientist. I'm demonstrating awe, awe and wonder and fascination. But but I'm also, the questions I ask are totally determined by the time in which I live. So, but I don't want to be postmodern because the point is that what's great, so that's all true from a psychological perspective. So you may say that the motivations of science are, are kind of a personal fantasy, but what's great is the science overcomes that. So that you're right. There are, in fact, if you, in my book, in the, in the book you read, The, the Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, I make a big point of saying, scientists were all moving in this direction and it was mm. the wrong direction. But, wait, but it, the doesn't science, overcome, the science it doesn't overcome the motivation. You. It doesn't overcome the motivation. It no, it overcomes it, the con it overcomes the contamination of the theory by the motivational impulse. But the motivation changes because the phys because the results force it upon you. Scientists are forced, kicking and screaming, to change their minds. They don't want to. But that motivation of the kind yes. of questions you ask come, be and that's the greatness of science because it's empirical. Because it's not based on just what I want, but what nature tells me is the case. And so eventually all the scientists who want this and are, and no doubt were driven in that direction because they wanted that, find out that that want is wrong and they have to go over here. And that's the beauty of science. It's that nature determines what's beautiful ultimately. You know, I, you know I, there was a while when string theorists talked about the elegant universe and all that. Elegant and beauty don't matter. Nature determines it, not scientists. And eventually we get drawn until we eventually come to a picture where we think it's beautiful, but it was nature you know, something that was incredibly ugly in the beginning that we thought was ugly ends up being beautiful because we force our picture to understand that that's the way it really is. And then we, we develop an understanding of it. But so that's the beauty. It's that I, I guess I, I don't think of it as a fantasy in that sense. Maybe the motivation is fant fantastical and even the process of some level. Well, there's, might a be there's a proposition, right? Which, which I think be, look, let, let me, let me give you another example of this and you tell me what you think. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'll try to formulate this properly, um, although I may not be able to do it. 
we have a hypothesis mm -hmm. that it's a fantasy, I would say, that the increase of knowledge through technical means will be of benefit to us as individuals and as a species. Okay, that is a that is a fantasy. Now it may be accurate. It's the fantasy that we've staked ourselves on, but there's it's not provable, and we're actually ambivalent about it because we generate apocalyptic nightmares all the time, and we know that our technological prowess has a Frankenstein element. Sure. So it's not like we're a hundred percent convinced that this nonstop onslaught of knowledge generation is necessarily in our best interests. And you could also make a case an evolutionary case that most species are stunningly conservative. If something works, man, they do not deviate from sure. it. Whereas we're just transforming like mad. And so we do have this fantasy, which is we can escape our static destiny by the acquisition of knowledge, by going out into the unknown. That's Star Trek, right? Yeah. You wrote books on the physics of Star Trek mm -hmm. to go boldly where no one has gone beyond before. Yeah. And that that will be of net benefit to us. And that's the fantasy which with when which this is nested. I don't think that does change. Well, you know, I mean, I, I understand your point. The, within I, that, there's transformations constantly. I think, but I think it wouldn't. Well, look, I agree with you to the most part. And in fact, regarding the the apocalyptic things, you must. One of the things you didn't mention is that I was chairman of the board of sponsors of the Bolton the Atomic Scientist for a dozen years that sets the doomsday clock. So every year, I'd have to stare apocalypse right in the in the face. But I think the the reason that fantasy has persisted, I would argue, is that it, like many fantasies, is that it has an evolutionary success. And the reason I, I agree, and, and the reason that it persists is that we have found that yeah, when we developed antibiotics, we can live longer. I mean, so there's a hope, and you're right, and and it comes back to what I said before: reason is a slave of passion. I recognize that when I think I'm being, you know, I'm being driven by pure rationality, I have to recognize that there's. That there's passion you can't behind it. Be. And, yeah, and, and that, well, that's it. This is so okay. And I think part of that, again, this is something I tried to draw out my conversations with, with Harris is well, we are evolved biological creatures. We're motivationally driven, like we and we have a pattern. We are not rational. That's so wrong. Now we can learn to be rational with great difficulty. Yeah. But fundamentally, and, and maybe that's a tool, but there is underneath this, you said it was an instant an instinct. So we could take that apart a little bit. Yeah. So the prefrontal cortex grew out of the motor cortex. Mm -hmm. So the motor cortex enables you to engage in voluntary activity. Yeah. The prefrontal cortex enables you to abstractly represent motor activity, play it out in an avatar-like universe, and kill off stupid ideas before they kill you. So we, we've we evolved to produce hypotheses, test them through, through dialectic often, yeah and dispense with those that don't work. And so we've we've staked ourselves on that attempt and we've evolved to be able to do that. And science, I believe, is a is the extension of that, the practical extension of that. The most successful so that's all, extension, I would argue. Yes, it's, mm -hmm. well, so successful so far, right? Yeah, so far. We have the time frame problem. Yeah, exactly. So, and, so on the apocalyptic end, let me ask you what you think of this. So we have a particular view of a hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. Now it's very reductionistic, right? And you can see the power of that because yeah. we understand hydrogen atoms well enough to make them, to turn them into bombs. Yeah. But you, I, you could also argue that it's because of that, it's because of the limitations of that form of knowledge that we were inclined to turn them into bombs, that we separated the hydrogen atom from its context, its broad, broad, broad context, and enabled us to manipulate a tiny fragment of reality to exclude the rest of reality from that consideration that bestowed upon us a tremendous power, but look what it produced. It produced the hydrogen bomb. And, you know, that could be evidence that the theory, however practically useful, for producing deadly machinery was not useful at all at a larger scale of analysis. You, and that, that's the that's the paradox, I guess, of, well, of the I reductionistic approach. Yeah, I think, it, well, you know, it's kind of like reminds me of the of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, a movie with Mickey Mouse or whatever it was, or yeah, I think Mickey was, Mouse. Yeah. yeah. And um, is the sense that it's it is a remarkable. Well, or maybe maybe I should do Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. But but um which may be a summary of your book. But anyway, um, uh, the we have this weird, I, I can't agree with you more. We have this weird dichotomy. We've discovered science. 
the, the scientific method was a discovery. It took a while to discover it. When the Greeks didn't have it, they did a lot, but if they'd been able to know about empirical evidence, they would have done a lot more. Um, and so it was a discovery, and it's a discovery that was incredibly powerful that works. But we humans, you know, um, didn't evolve and didn't evolve to discover the scientific method. I mean, we had the capability and therefore we have all sorts of evolutionary baggage that makes us human. And so we're on the one hand have this incredible power by using the scientific method, but on the other hand, have the fact that we are human and we have all the slings and arrows that came with being human, all of the, the evolutionary, evolutionarily positive and negative features of having developed a psyche as you described it. One with, you know, I had a, a, a podcast with uh, Joseph Ledoux. I don't know if you know him. Um, yep. and, oh, yeah. and we talked a great deal about fear in the amygdala and, and, and how those things play out. Um, but so we have, we have this, we have the people that are manipulating this scientific method who are, who are subject to all of the concerns that may, you know, the jealousies, the, the, the insecurities and the wonder all combined. And somehow we have to combine those to keep us safe and 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 secure and to make in principle a better again just saying we want a better future for our children you're right that's a fantasy too that's a that's a that's a claim it doesn't have to be why do we want to do that well for some reason we think it's a good idea um um maybe yeah, it's for some reason we believe that there's such thing as better yeah right? uh, yeah and we and we quantify it and we and again i would argue see to me i'm a i'm a solid empiricist if there's not an empirical way of dis, of defining why it's better, then it's an irrelevant concept, and that's why I have a. I'm this just. I'm a very pedestrian kind of guy. If you mm -hmm. can't measure it, don't talk about it to some extent. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, right, and, right, and and um, and, uh, and so. Well, that, if you can't measure it, you can't define it, and then it's hard to tell what the hell you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's yeah. You, then problem, it just ends man. up being that's... semantics. Then it ends up being pure uh, intellectual masturbation. You know, mm -hmm. which is a lot of yeah. And you can shift supposedly. the concept around at your convenience, yeah. which is not helpful. Which is yeah, and that's what sort of I would argue much of postmodernism is all about. Is that is that it's lost track of what is real, and and it's just sort of intellectual circles. With